Block News starts right now. And we begin tonight with new information on the availability of the COVID-19 vaccine in San Antonio. We're learning the delayed shipment of the Pfizer vaccine to Bear County is expected to arrive tomorrow. Officials with the Department of State Health Services confirmed that to KSAT News within roughly the last 30 minutes. That delay, though, caused appointments scheduled for today at the Alamo Dome to be moved till Wednesday. Mayor Ron Nuremberg announced that change yesterday, but Karen Berger found out that not everyone got the word. He tells us about that and other uncertainties surrounding the vaccination process. Roger Moreno showed up at the Alamo Dome with one goal today, getting his vaccine. Some friends and relatives passed away already, you know, and it's kind of scary. The retired veteran from Universal City had his appointment, but hadn't heard about the reschedule. A disappointment, but no bother. Well, I have to wait, I have to wait. Josefino Ruiz also showed up for a noon appointment today and thought at first she was in the wrong spot. Nope, just the wrong day. So I stay here. I'm, I'm going to camp. I'm going to camp here. A Metro Health spokeswoman says they emailed or texted everyone. But if someone didn't enter their info correctly, that may have been the issue. But it wasn't just confusion about today's appointments. We also ran into at least one couple that was confused about how to get their second dose. Claiborne and Walton Gregory got their first dose on the 13th, but were among the people who weren't immediately signed up for a second appointment. Now they're trying to fix that. The website is very clearly for first time shots. Uh, so I'm sort of at a loss as to what to do. Having unsuccessfully tried calling 311 dozens of times and only been referred back to the website when he emailed, Gregory decided to see if he could get answers in person. A little frustrating. I mean, it's clearly a very small number of people adversely affected, but I, unfortunately, we unfortunately are in that group of adversely affected people. A Metro Health spokeswoman told KSAT they're still contacting people. And if you're in the same boat as the Gregory's and haven't heard back by the end of the week, the city wants you to email COVID-19 at sanantonio.gov. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. And we're expecting to have an update on that Pfizer shipment delay later on in this newscast during the COVID-19 daily briefing, which happens at 613. And as always, you can find the very latest information about the vaccine on our website, like how many doses Bear County can expect next, or the list of who's eligible to get the vaccine at this point. Just head to ksap.com. The cancellation of San Antonio's MLK Day March has prompted a cross section of local judges to come up with a unique way to remember Dr. King's legacy this year. They made a video of Dr. King's famous I have a dream speech. Paul Venema now with what makes that video so unique. The project began with juvenile court judge Carlos Quisada posing a question to his fellow judges. How can we put a message out to the community letting them know that, you know, uh, we're still with them on this day? And so we came up with the video and we put it together. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discourse of our nation. The video, he said, is a sort of substitute for the parade. He saw it began by having each judge record a portion of Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs stating for whites only. Imagine trying to get them all to get a video in at a certain time so that we could have it ready uh, for Martin Luther King Day. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge, but it's a challenge that we all tackle together. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. None of us judges are very tech savvy, I'll tell you the truth. Uh, and so it, it, it was a challenge. I'm, I'm very blessed to have had the help uh, of some friends of mine. Not tech savvy, perhaps, but judges sharing an historic message of inspiration. Our hope is that, you know, families get to watch it together, maybe with your children. You know, the message of Martin Luther King. So let freedom ring. The judicial reading is available on YouTube. Just look for Bear County Judges MLK Day. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News. This, is this has been a day of reflection on the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. This year set against a turbulent backdrop from Black Lives Matter protests to the riots at the Capitol. Jesse DeGoyado now with some thoughts from those who still believe in Dr. King's dream. The image of Buffalo soldier Ezekiel Allen saluting Martin Luther King Jr. was part of this year's virtual MLK observance that many would say was especially needed at a time of national upheaval. Dr. King would say, march on. He'd say, don't let that distract us 
from our purpose and our goals. And that's what we are doing. We are marching on in the spirit of Dr. Martin Luther King. Hands up! Many believe his spirit helped fuel last summer's protests against racial injustice that ultimately became a worldwide movement. I definitely think Dr. King believes that Black Lives Matter. I think he would be behind this movement 1,000 percent. And in the aftermath of the insurrection at the U.S. Capitol that many African Americans say would have been much deadlier had Black Lives Matter been involved. We want to stand stronger now more than ever. So it's very important that we keep up the dream that he had for democracy, especially considering what happened at the nation's capital last week. It's a block party, huh? At the burger joint, that's a favorite gathering spot for MLK marchers. After they're done, the organizer of the first annual MLK block party offered a simple reflection. We don't have to use violence to uh, get a point across. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. Walking with masks and ready to pay their respects to the legacy of MLK. That was the scene this morning during the inaugural MLK Walk for Freedom. The Blue Skies of Texas West Campus organized the walk today in partnership with United Way and the San Antonio Virtual Walk. Those in attendance say they wanted to find a way to celebrate Dr. King's message, even though they couldn't do the things they normally do. But we still have that spirit. We're wearing masks, we're social distancing, we're walking in pods of people around our walk, so we're staying far away, but we're still connected in this really incredible way that I think also really speaks to MLK's message. Blue Skies of Texas is a retirement community here in San Antonio, and around 50 residents and staff participated in that walk today. As students continue to adjust to life amid the pandemic, a Northeast ISD librarian says social and emotional learning is still essential for kids. That's why she created a space in the library filled with not just books, but unique ways to help kids deal with the unique challenges of this pandemic. Tiffany Huertas has a look at how it's already impacting students. School continues to look different these days due to COVID-19. During lunch, we're social distancing. James Madison High School senior Alexis Williams says she misses her friends. Being able to just go out and hang out with them and not be worried about us getting COVID. Williams came across something that allowed her to take her mind off of things. It was in my statistics teacher's classroom, just kind of sitting right by her desk. It was Play-Doh in a bag. Play-Doh is a sensory activity. When the school year started, librarian Katina Wright created different kits for students. Activities that were unplugged, um, friendship bracelets, adult coloring pages. This led Wright to create a social emotional learning section at the library. Stories that are about friendship or um, about teenagers that have struggled with something like a death in the family, things like that, and how they get through that. There are also kits and pamphlets for students to take. Self-esteem, anxiety, depression, um, empathy, grief and loss. We have to do whatever we can and whatever's in our power to make sure that we're trying to meet the social and emotional needs of our learners as well as the academic needs. Wright says there is also a section for teacher with books that can help with social emotional learning in the classroom. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. We have new details about a rollover crash from I-10 this morning. The driver died in that accident. The Bear County Medical Examiner identified her as 21-year-old Nina Leva. The crash happened just after 3 a.m. in the 13,200 block of I-10 North. San Antonio police say Leva hit a curb, causing her vehicle to lose control and then roll over across multiple lanes. That's when an 18-wheeler ran into her vehicle. They stopped and called police. Leva was transported to University Hospital, where she later died. A family is thankful to be alive, but devastated after their home caught fire twice. That fire happened on the west side along Harness Lane near Rim Fire Drive in Loop 410. Take a look at those flames. The first flame sparking just before 8 o'clock last night. The two people inside got out safely. Then the second fire happened around 3 this morning. Neighboring houses had to be evacuated while fire crews battled the flames that time. The family lost everything. Later today, neighbors stopped by the home to offer a helping hand to the family. I'm pretty sure she's devastated. So I just wanted to just come and see if she was here to get her, give her some money. Knowing the fact that she lost everything was just terrible. 
The San Antonio Fire Department says it is still not clear if the fire is a rekindle from the first one Sunday night. As of now, the cause of both fires still under investigation. Look outside with live cam this evening, squeezing out some sunshine because we've got some uh, some changes headed this way, Sarah. Yeah, definitely changes on the way in the form of rainfall. We are going to see a couple of uh, gray and damp days here over the next couple of days in San Antonio. But hey, we need the rain. So here's a look at today's time lapse. A beautiful sunset. We were able to see a little bit of that sun after a cloudy start. And in fact, temperatures got up to 73 degrees this afternoon. Now looking ahead tonight, we are going to see clouds increase. In fact, it'll be cloudy by midnight with drizzle overnight and mild too. temperatures only in the 60s this evening. Tomorrow we're going to have drizzle and light rain to start the day, but then a 60% chance for scattered showers and even a few storms as that cold front moves through. But not only are we going to have rain tomorrow, but we're also going to have rain for a good portion of the week. So coming up, I'll tell you which days are, are the best to see some rainfall in San Antonio and which days are the best to get some time outdoors. We are just seconds away now from the first daily briefing of the new week when it comes to COVID-19 cases in our community. We saw a bit of a drop off when it comes to hospitalizations to end the week. Let's see where the numbers stand today. Who's the assistant director for Metro Health, and this is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Tonight we're reporting 1,281 new cases of COVID-19, which brings our total to 149,000. 836 since this began. Our seven day rolling average now remains above the 2000 mark, but we stand at 2028. Unfortunately, we do have three new deaths to report tonight a black male in his 80s and two Hispanic males in their 50s and 70s. Uh, please keep their friends and families in your prayers this evening. Unfortunately, we are also seeing a significant increase in our hospitals. There are 1,520 patients in local hospitals tonight, which is actually up 81 from yesterday. I think that is our largest single day increase uh, during this pandemic. There, that's an increase also of 261 pa patients compared to one week ago, and it's the highest number of COVID-19 patients we have ever seen in our hospitals uh, during this pandemic. We've had 174 new admissions in the last 24 hours, so that continues to uh, be a very high number for us. Uh, 437 patients in the intensive care unit and 260 on ventilators with COVID. Uh, very quickly, a vaccine update. Uh, thankfully, uh, we did receive word. Uh, remember last night we told you about a delay in the shipment of vaccines from Pfizer. Metro Health has today received conf confirmation on our next shipment of COVID-19 vaccinations. And so we will begin, uh, excuse me, we will resume our appointments on Wednesday at the Alamo Dome. So those will be secured. Um, let me turn it over first to uh, Judge Wolf, and then I'll come back on an update on the blood supply. Well, thank you. And of course, the hospital numbers are really disturbing. Um, uh, that, that's really taxing on the hospitals, but there is some silver lining. Uh, we had a high infection rate of 23.2% since this surge has began again. It went down to 19.7%, and this week it went down to 17.5%. So... That's a positive sign, but you got to remember hospitalizations occur some couple of weeks after your big uh, surge in, in people that are positive. So uh, that's why we're seeing the hospitalization. Uh, they've had to work hard to bring in more nurses uh, from out, out of the city. We have 1,441 nurses now where we had like 1,300 last week. So they're gearing up and they're uh, uh, making sure that they'll be able to handle it here. Uh, because of the problems that we had with the shipment of COVID, uh, I mean, uh, the COVID uh, drug, uh, <laughs> Pfizer, uh, we did have some left over from the hospitalization. And so we did 1,535 uh, today uh, vaccines. They were given to uh, people that are in education, teachers, and then as well as sick, uh, vulnerable patients of UHS. So uh, University Hospital System uh, did a good job yesterday. Uh, we'll be open again tomorrow. Again, for the whole week now, it's going to be just for teachers and educators and for uh, people with that are really vulnerable in the EUH system. Uh, at the same time that we're doing this, we're still doing about 300 a, a day down at the Robert B. Green 
that's police, fire, EMS, uh, first responders, bus drivers. So our, our program is continuing. We may see a change uh, when the Biden uh, administration comes in uh, with respect to vaccines. There was a story in the New York Times today stating that the Biden um, uh, administration will loosen restrictions of who can get it and who can't, that they will have more sites, that they're going to mobilize more health professionals, and that they're going to use the power of the federal government to accelerate uh, production so that we don't have these bog ups that we've been having and not knowing whether we're going to get it or not. So uh, could be some changes coming when the Biden so, <coughs> our administration gets in. All right, thank you, Judge, and we will certainly keep you updated on that. I also want to uh, take a look at our progress and in warning indicators now that it's Monday. Uh, so if we can put that up, we're continuing to see increases in our seven-day rolling case average. At the end of December, that number was around 1,100. As I mentioned earlier, that number is uh, above 2,000 now, and it has been for the last week or so. The case rate has also increased significantly, 103.4 which is a big jump from last week when it was in the 80s. And as the judge just mentioned, one sign uh, of a little bit of hopefulness is the positivity rate, which declined for the second consecutive week. It was 19.7% uh, last week, and it's now 17.5% this week. The hospital stress score has increased, however, to the higher end of the high zone, and so the overall risk level for Bear County remains severe and worsening. Uh, keep that in mind as you venture out. Please keep your mask up and practice physical distancing, et cetera. One final note, over the past week, our hospital's blood orders have been about 35 percent above average. Uh, that is taxing on our blood supplies. And the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center reports that the inventory is now below adequate with less than a four-day supply on hand. Type O blood is at a critical level with just over one day supply. You can help with this, and we need you to, by participating in this, in this week's San Antonio City Council Members SA District Challenge Blood Drive, which is scheduled in all 10 of our council districts. Please support the blood drive in your area, or to give blood at one of the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center's donor rooms, you can make an appointment to donate at southtexasblood.org, or you can call University Hospital at 210 358 2812. And finally, all right, the mayor there talking about a challenge that our city's been dealing with throughout this pandemic, a uh, shortage of blood, and especially yeah. at a time when hospitals are in such high demand. He said that right now the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center has less than a four day supply of blood on hand. So he was encouraging everyone to make an appointment, do what you can to help out. Uh, because what we're seeing in the hospitals is another record. We've seen record after record be broken when it comes to the number of people hospitalized. And today that number stands at 1,520 patients in the hospital with COVID-19. Meanwhile, some good news that Pfizer shipment that was delayed, which re resulted in people not being able to go to the Alamo Dome today to get their doses now has come in. So those appointments at the Alamo Dome will resume on Wednesday. So stay tuned if you're one of those people who found themselves being canceled. You should be getting some information about that. The other good news uh, there is that the positivity rate continues to go down, uh, which is something that is moving in the right direction with these numbers. Yeah, the county judge kind of put that in perspective, saying that it has dropped for two weeks in a row and now stands at 17.5 percent. But typically after you see a, a spike in that, that's when we see two weeks or so later um, the really high hospital count, which is where we are uh, right now. So we'll keep you updated on how those numbers change, hoping to see some encouraging news uh, here soon. Let's turn now to the weather and we got some changes. Yeah, some rain in our forecast tomorrow morning. You'll notice that it'll be a little damp and gray out there with areas of drizzle. Let's go ahead and show your forecast for tomorrow. Temperatures tomorrow will stay in the 60s, but will carry a 60% chance for scattered showers and storms, especially as we head into the afternoon. But the whole day is going to be gray and damp. East northeast winds at 10 to 20 miles per hour. As a cold front moves through in the afternoon, temperatures will fall. But we have a continuation of rain chances not only tomorrow, but also on Wednesday, a big upper level low is going to meander just over the southwestern portion of the United States, continue to bring us some energy, and that's why we'll have rain chances continue, honestly, 
pretty much throughout the week, but the best rain chances are tomorrow and Wednesday. There's our cold front right now working its way through Midland Odessa. It's a weak front. Uh, we're not going to see any cold Arctic blast of air, but it is going to be enough to help spark off some showers and storms. This is a look at tomorrow morning at 7. That's when we'll have some drizzle in the area as that front attempts to move through in the afternoon. That's when we could see showers become a bit more numerous, but it is going to be on and off again and uh, potential for one or two rumbles of thunder. As we head into Wednesday, rain chances are going to continue throughout the day on Wednesday, but eventually let up Wednesday evening. And then by Thursday, Friday and Saturday, we'll really only have isolated showers in the area. So again, tomorrow and Wednesday, 60% chance for scattered showers, potentially even a few storms tomorrow, but no severe weather. And then we actually see our rain chances tick back up again as we head into next week. Wednesday is going to be cool with the ongoing rain. Temperatures are going to probably only get into the 50s in the afternoon. But other than that, it's a pretty spring like forecast with a chance for isolated rain every day after Wednesday and temperatures close to 70 degrees in the afternoon. Plenty of chances. Yep, Sarah. Spurs kicking off a road trip in Portland this afternoon. This is their best game of the season so far all around. Defense, office, assist, it was just an amazing game. When we come back, Spurs tip off their road trip in Portland, and they set a record in doing so. We'll let you know what that is. And the final four in the NFL, we now know. Coming up. San Antonio Spurs open their two-game West Coast road trip with a monumental win against the Blazers in Portland this afternoon. In doing so, improved to 6-2 and two on the road this season. One of the top five road records in the Western Conference in their first win in the Motor Center since 2017. Playing without C.J. McCollum, the Blazers relied heavily on Damian Lillard, who led all scorers with 35 points. He helped keep it close along with LaMarcus Aldridge early on, who led the Spurs with 22. But the key to the Spurs' win was the fourth quarter. The Spurs outscored the Blazers 38-22 to behind Patty Mills and Rudy Gay. Mills had 21 points, including five three-pointers, and now has a record for the most three-pointers on one team off the bench, beating out former teammate Manu Ginobili and Rudy Gay, who came alive in the fourth quarter, scoring 21 as well. The first time in Spurs history, four Spurs over 30 have put up at least 20 points or more in the 125-104 victory. Especially with the early game today, you know, we had to bring the energy and kind of um, generate that early. Um, and, you know, we try to go out there and set the tone early older guys and make sure you know, it would be one of those games that we, we take control of and not you know, try to fill our way into the game. Yeah, it's kind of funny. When you're 30, you're older in the NBA. Next up, the Warriors in San Francisco Wednesday at 9 p.m. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. The Kansas City Chiefs were able to keep their playoff run alive by holding off the Cleveland Browns despite losing their star quarterback for most of the second half, leading 19 to 10 in the third quarter. Mahomes tried to run with the ball, only to be brought down hard. And you can see when he tried to get back to his feet, he was woozy at best. He was able to jog to the locker room, but was deemed out for the rest of the game due to concussion protocol. That left the door open for Baker Mayfield and the Browns, who began a comeback early in the fourth quarter. Kareem Hunt from three yards out, and we've got ourselves a ball game at 20. 17. But in steps Mahomes, 35 year old backup Chad Henning, and watching pick up 13 yards in this run, coming up one yard short of a first down to seal the game. And then head coach Andy Reid with the gutsiest call of the game, a pass on fourth and one to Tyree Kill, and the game is over. Kansas City is headed to the AFC Championship game to face Buffalo 22 to 17. The big question is will the reigning Super Bowl MVP be ready? I just leave that with Rick and the Docs, and I, uh, because of the protocol, we don't. We, it's a no-brainer from the coach's standpoint. You don't have to think about it. You just have to go forward and make sure you have an answer if he's there and an answer if he's not there. Uh, I can't tell you from a medical standpoint where he's at. I mean, I don't know that. So uh, that's their decision, and I just follow it. You can tell how shaky he looked while he was trying to get up there. The Bills and the Chiefs, Sunday at 540 at Arrowhead Stadium. Meantime, 43-year-old Tom Brady and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers won the battle of the two oldest quarterbacks in the league when they defeated 42-year-old Drew Brees and the New Orleans Saints. Turnovers were the big problem this game for the Saints, four and in all, including three interceptions off of Brees and what more than likely is his final game in the NFL, retiring to the broadcast booth. Meantime, Brady threw for two touchdowns, ran for another. That's right, a one-yard plunge to seal the win, 30-20, to and advance the Bucs to the NFC Championship game for the first time since 2002 and for Brady his postseason record is now 32 and 11 which is better than most franchises in the NFL except for five and double that of any other quarterback in the league but the big question now is Drew Dunn I'll, I'll answer this this question one time and that is that I'm going to give myself an opportunity to uh to 
you know, think about the season, think about a lot of things, just like I did last year, and um, make a decision. He has a contract, by the way, waiting for him in the broadcast booth. Tampa Bay taking on Green Bay Sunday at 2.05 at Lambeau Field. And what a career that young man is. And remember, it started right here in Texas. Hmm. I would take the booth. Nobody hits back. Absolutely. It. Nobody hits back. You got it right. Thanks, Greg. Sure. Thanks, Greg. We'll be right back. Today, the na nation is honoring the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., all his important work and the work that is still left to be done in our country. And on any other year, we would have 300,000 people gathering here in San Antonio for one of the biggest marches in the entire country. Of course, that was a little different this year, given the pandemic. For today's KSAT Q&A, we want to bring in Renee Watson, chair of the city's MLK Commission. Thanks so much for being here. Still, even though it was virtual, a huge day for your organization. Talk to us about why the commission believed it was so important to hold an event, even in mid coronavirus, albeit virtual. Well, thank you for the opportunity to share. It has been a tremendous day for a monumental uh, celebration of the life and legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, we have been involved with this march, uh, whether with Reverend Callis is starting and marching for infrastructure 53 years ago, or when the city of San Antonio partnered with uh, the community 34 years ago. So back in February, when we noticed that the uh, conversations were individuals were canceling, organizations were canceling activity, we wanted to say we really needed to do something this day to celebrate. We knew it would be two days before the inauguration. We know how much of a commitment the issues are with the political and social and economic injustice and unrest in the country. So we had to do something, and we got very smart and deliberate about using our technology to create a film that we showed today. Now, when I first moved here 17 years ago, I was surprised to find out that San Antonio had one of the largest MLK marches in the United States. How did it become that big, and, and what does it say about San Antonio as a whole? It says that San Antonio believes in diversity and commitment to issues, because when we first started the march, like I said, it was about the issues, whether it was infrastructure, sidewalk, but San Antonio's population is so diverse. We're a military city, USA. You know, San Antonio integrated the first lunch counters many, many years ago. When you look at the history of our city, we have several battles. We may disagree, but we always agree to be, not to be disagreeable. And we work together. We play together. We live in the same neighborhoods together. So therefore we can share uh, the opportunity and the life and the legacy of Dr. King together. So whether you're coming out to the march, when you first got here 17 years ago, or, or when your grandmother or your mother was a part of it, because I was contacted all day today about Zoom party. Um, people around the country were trying to figure out how to watch it with their families, uh, especially in this virtual environment and have their kids there. And now they can replay this virtually because it's not just a one day. It's like Dr. King's legacy is not just the, the holiday. It's a day on, but it's really, it's not just that day off of the holiday. So we wanted to make sure you can do something else to fulfill for education. And I think we did that today. You touched on this just a moment ago, but I want to talk about it a little bit more and ask you whether current events that have influenced this country have impacted all of us over the last year really play into uh, the mission of the MLK Commission with the death of George Floyd, protests for racial equality, police reform, and then also the, the effect that COVID-19 has had on minority communities. They've been disproportionately affected. So are all of those things playing into your mission? Absolutely. The mission of the MLK commi of the Commission is to support, support and promote nonviolence, to look at ways that we can enhance uh, not only equal equality and equity, but the whole racial uh, aspect of what's happening in the country. We highlighted that because here in our community, we have experience and we have families that have been impacted by the same types of in in uh, incidences like George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and those things that have happened in this community. But like the mayor says, it's his city and he was committed to do something about it. We have a DA that just created for the first time an Office of Civil Rights that appointed someone to really examine those types of cases. So when we look at San Antonio, we look at how we can work together, whether it's from the election officials, what's happening in the upcoming legislative session of our federal legislators, or right here in the neighborhood from the, from the bottom up with the, with the community. 
A big part of uh, your your operation is to uh, help education. You guys have some scholarships, and you wanted to talk a little bit about that. Tell us about the scholarships that are available here in San Antonio. Absolutely, because one of the, the things in the life and legacy of Dr. King is promoting education to make sure that our students, especially in this pandemic, can have a, 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 an opportunity. If they started their education, and then because of the COVID, they had to stop attending St. Coach College, and also at this college, the UTSA, or either some college around the country. We have an opportunity for them to go to the San Antonio.gov uh, slash MLK website, because our applications for scholarship assistance is open until February 26th. There are several workshops that we'll be conducting uh, to get them even to help them to, uh, to submit the uh, application, because it is a very competitive bid process. And again, you said February 26th, that's the deadline. I want to make sure we repeat that. That's correct. That's when they will be distributed. Because okay. there's four workshops every Saturday between now and then. And you can register for those workshops. So if it's a mom, a dad, and you're homeschooling or you're virtual learning, please go to sanitarium.gov uh, slash MLK and find out about the scholarship that we'll have available for our community students. Okay, and, and as we round out this interview, I, I want to ask you something, you know, in the vein of education, uh, what would your message be to young students who might be learning about Martin Luther King? That is history to them, but they're witnessing movements like we've seen over the last year. They're witnessing Black Lives Matter. What would your message be to them to put all of that in perspective? So we had a uh, U-Town Hall, and one of the young people that was there from the Boys and Girls Club made a very profound statement. She said that she always does her research. She does more than just look on her friends, on her social media, but she tries to find out the facts. Then she goes to the adults and she tries to have those conversations, not only with her family and friends, but her teachers, from coaches, and anyone in the community that she can talk to to find out what's really going on. And how can she better get, gain uh, information to help her to go forward as she moves uh, into her adult life? And I think that is so very, very important with so much disinformation in our social media platforms, that you reach out and you talk to your family and try to get the true story of what's going on. Yeah, trying to get perspectives, many different perspectives on any topic is, is crucial, especially these days. Renee Watson, thanks so much for the work that you do and thanks for joining us here this evening. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be right back. President Trump on the verge of his second impeachment trial, but his defense still in disarray. His personal lawyer, lawyer Rudy Giuliani, spotted at the White House over the weekend, now saying he won't be on the president's legal team because his role in the rally before the riot makes him a witness. The two lawyers who led the president's defense during his first impeachment also are not expected to represent him this time around. And the clock is ticking. Nancy Pelosi expected to send the article of impeachment to the Senate any day now. Democrats need at least 17 Republicans to vote with them in order to convict the president. Today, as we honor the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., it's also a national day of service, a chance to give back. President-elect Joe Biden and his wife, Dr. Jill Biden, spent the day in Philadelphia doing just that. You can see them lined up sorting food at Phil Abundance. That's a group that distributes more than 24 million pounds of food a year to those in need. The future president packed beans. The future first lady packed rice alongside their daughter and granddaughter. Vice President-elect Kamala Harris and her family also volunteering today. Sunny day there in Philadelphia. Here we started off with clouds and the sun came out. Beautiful sunset out there right now. Yeah, beautiful sunset, but I think that's the last time we're going to be able to see the sunset until potentially Thursday. Yeah, you heard that right. We're going to be socked into gray uh, skies and rainfall through the next couple of days. It's pretty mild out there, though, this evening. If you do want to enjoy that sunset, temperatures are generally in the 60s. It's still 71 degrees, though, at the airport. Now, coming up in the forecast, we're going to talk about a few things. Tonight, clouds are going to return. In fact, by midnight, it should be cloudy. Tomorrow, we'll have scattered showers and storms throughout the day. And in fact, rain chances continue all week. It's a pretty spring-like active weather pattern for the end of January, but don't worry, I'll detail all of it for you so that you can pre be prepared on which days to bring the umbrella to work or out and about with family. 
You've been waiting for some rain chances. We got some coming our way, Sarah. Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah, and we're going to talk about rainfall amounts too. Now, this upcoming weather pattern, it's going to be interesting. There are going to be the haves and the have nots when it comes to the rainfall. There will be some places that potentially get up to an inch of rain and others that will only receive a few tenths. So that's just the nature of the game over the next few days. But tonight, what we'll see are clouds increasing around San Antonio. Let's take a look at tonight's forecast. Again, we're in the 70s right now, but by midnight, we'll be at 60 degrees. A pretty mild evening for January. Temperatures not falling into the 50s uh, for the next mm, about 24 hours or so. Uh, and again, we'll see some drizzle develop overnight as well. One of the factors of, of seeing the rainfall is the increase in moisture that we've had at the surface. This is a look at dew points. Dew points are in the 50s and even starting to get into the 60s across the coastal plains. This may not seem all that impressive on our dew point scale, but look at the change of dew points in the last 24 hours. Moisture has increased by 20 to 25 to even 30 degrees in the area. Moisture at the surface, of course, one of the ingredients for rainfall. Another ingredient, some upper level support. And we've got an upper level low over Baja, California right now. And this upper level low is just going to meander to the south and to the west of us in Texas here. And so over the next couple of days, we'll see rain chances and rain chances will honestly continue into the weekend as well. Although our best chances for rain are tomorrow and Wednesday. Here's a look at a cold front. We've also got that that's going to help for one of the ingredients for rainfall. 46 in Amarillo, but almost 80 degrees in Laredo. So let me take you through the high res future cast. This is a look at tomorrow morning at about 7 o'clock. We're going to have some areas of drizzle and that front will still be to our north. But as that front approaches, scattered showers and yes, even a few storms are going to be possible, but we're not worried about severe weather. You may just hear a rumble of thunder, or see a flash of lightning with some of the heavier spots that get some rainfall when that front moves through. That front will move through in the afternoon hour shortly probably before dinner and then we'll see temperatures drop. It'll get breezy and we'll see rain continue overnight Tuesday into Wednesday as that front stalls to our south. As you can see here, it looks like a bullseye area of rainfall is going to be to the south and to the west of San Antonio as that rain continues on Wednesday during the day and areas to the south and west of San Antonio. Those are the areas under some extreme drought, so that's good news. And those areas, especially out toward Del Rio, Eagle Pass, some spots could see maximum rainfall potential of three quarters to an inch of rain. Meanwhile, around San Antonio, potentially half an inch to three quarters of an inch of rain with less, less than half an inch through Friday out toward the coastal plain. So again, those areas from Yavaldi all the way down to Carrizo Springs out toward Eagle Pass and Del Rio are under severe Severe and extreme drought and even parts of uh, northwestern Bear County are under severe drought as well. So any rain we will welcome this time of year. We need need the rainfall and, and again it's about a 60% chance tomorrow, 60% chance on Wednesday. We'll see rain chances taper off by Thursday, Friday and Saturday, but we can't rule out a few isolated showers and potentially a few storms on those days. Then we'll see rain chances tick back up by Monday. We'll have scattered showers back in the forecast. So tomorrow, just to summarize everything for you, drizzle and light rain in the morning, 60 degrees and 60% chance for scattered showers throughout the day. We'll only make it up to 65 in the afternoon because of the cloud cover and continuing rainfall. That front will move through in the afternoon. Our temperatures will drop down into the 50s and it'll be breezy with east north wind, uh, east winds at 10 to 20 miles per hour. We'll likely get down into the 40s to start Wednesday, but because we'll be socked into cloud cover with continuing rainfall, Temperatures will struggle to get out of the low 50s on Wednesday. We'll finally start to see a little bit of sun by Thursday in the afternoon. And again, just a few isolated showers possible through the weekend. All right, thank you, Sarah. In case you missed it, coming up next. morning. As you just heard, it is Monday. It is January 18th. Happy MLK Day. Thank you so much for starting your morning with us. Woman is facing charges of driving while intoxicated after police say she crashed on Babcock near Wurzbach around 2 this morning. One person in that SUV was taken to University Hospital. We don't know that person's condition. Also new this morning, a driver is recovering in the hospital after he crashed his car and two metal dividers. Castle Hills police tell us he was taken to University Hospital in stable condition. He did not suffer any serious injuries. Police say he was intoxicated, but details on possible charges are unclear at this time. Other top stories we're following for you today. A man was killed after police say he ran a stop sign and crashed into a via bus. Police say the driver in a sedan was T-boned 
by the VIA bus when he failed to stop at a stop sign. The sedan then rolled into a nearby parking lot, ejecting the driver. Police tell us the vehicle landed on top of the man who died at the scene. Two others on the bus suffered minor injuries. I were following late breaking news of a fire east of downtown. It took fire crews, several fire crews, a lot of time to knock down the flames at this home. It was fully engulfed when the firefighters got there. No injuries have been reported. No word on a cause. It's a developing story, though, and we'll bring you the latest as it becomes available. Health experts, in fact, projecting some dark weeks ahead. The nation's death toll nearing the 400,000 mark. According to the CDC, at least 88 cases of a highly contagious coronavirus variant, first identified in the UK, is now confirmed in 14 states. <laughs> The rain rolls in tomorrow, 60% chance for scattered showers and a few storms tomorrow. We'll also see rain on Wednesday. It'll be a little cooler on those days as well. In fact, we'll carry a chance for isolated showers through the weekend. All right, thanks, Sarah. And thanks for watching the news at 6. See you back here for the Night Beat tonight at 10. Have a good evening.